I, um, I began my career uh, studying economics, but I, I gave it up for a very good reason, that economics, as it has come to be understood, uh, is very, became a very technical analysis of something called the economy. Uh, it had almost no sense of society, and it had certainly very little concern with questions of ethics. But the incredible financial disaster that has now beset many countries, including my own, has interestingly forced questions of ethics back onto the economic agenda. Here's Stephen Green, the group chairman of HSBC. Those of you who don't know what that stands for, it's the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank. Um, they don't like you to know that it's actually got most of its assets in Asia, so it's called HSBC. Here you see him wondering whether they've done the right thing, uh, whether the, the headlong pursuit of growth in a very narrowly defined sense is good for the well-being and quality of life. And here we have my current Prime Minister, maybe not to be Prime Minister for much longer. Um, if you want to see a really surreal uh, thing on YouTube, you should watch Gordon Brown smiling. Um, <laughs> th this is a Scot who grew up in um, um, a parsonage. His father was a, a, a vicar. Uh, he, he really doesn't know how to smile. Um, he's a very deeply serious and, and principled man, but he was, I think, badly encouraged by his advisors that he should really get into YouTube and Twitter and all of these things. So he made a video, and he's, he, he's you know, and somebody's obviously whispering, you know, smile, Gordon. And uh, it's one of the most grotesque things you can find on... on um, um, but here's a man who, as Chancellor of the Exchequer, presided over the radical deregulation of the financial sector in Britain in the belief that if everything was let rip, the City of London would become the world's great financial hub and that would be the centre of a new kind of capitalism which wouldn't make motor cars, we don't do that, it wouldn't make steel, we don't do that, it wouldn't have coal mines, we don't do that, but it would be a form of capitalism based on the manipulation of uh, financial information, other kinds of information, symbolic life. I want you to look particularly at that last line, that we have discovered to our cost that without values to guide them, free markets reduce all relationships to transactions, all motivations to self-interest. Unbridled, they become the enemy of the good society. What drew me to political economy or the tradition of political economy was precisely that question. Political economy originates in the 18th century and it's very much part of that great philosophical uh, revolution that we now call the Enlightenment. Um, that the question that people were struggling to answer was not only what kind of a society is coming into view as industrialization began to gather momentum, but much more profoundly, what was the relationship between the production and circulation of goods and the good society? What kind of a society do we create if we organise economic relations in one way or another? One of the key figures in that debate was Adam Smith. Adam Smith is remembered now, by, mostly by people who've never read him, um, as a defender of, of free markets in, in tooth and claw. Actually, he wasn't. Uh, he uh, had a very strong role for the state. But before he wrote his book, that we now all remember, The Wealth of Nations, which interestingly comes out in 1776, the year of the American Revolution, which we'll come back to in a minute. He wrote a book that made him immensely famous throughout Europe. This book's called A Theory of Moral Sentiments. Here you have a man, look particularly at that last one. Society may be upheld by a mercenary exchange of good offices according to an agreed valuation. But without mutual love or affection, it will not be in its most comfortable state. So for, for Smith, benevolence, uh, generosity, was 
the most important quality that human kind had. It's what distinguished them primarily from the animals. Not so much rationality, but benevolence. And that question has become quite central now. This is a quotation from my, one of my old tutors at the London School of Economics, Richard Titmus, specialist in social policy. And it comes from a book he wrote on blood donorship. Um, a beautiful book. But he asks this question, why would you give your blood away to people? People you will never see, people who will never come to thank you. And he poses this as a bigger question. Who is my stranger? Who do we have responsibilities towards in a complex society like us, ourselves? For me, now, I think we have to broaden that out um, to a global perspective. Whatever doubts you might have about some of the evidence for the human contribution to global warming, my own reading of the, the literature, which is now quite extensive because I've been working on it, is that there is no question that uh, the way we conduct our affairs, and particularly our economic affairs, is making a very substantial contribution to global warming. And the consequences of that will be primarily felt in the southern hemisphere amongst the poorest, most disadvantaged people on the planet. So we have to ask ourselves, what is our responsibility towards them? And what is our responsibility towards the generations who will come after us? So Titmus's question, who is my stranger, for me is now a, a global question. And so it matters very much how we organize communications. For me, the most important question is, how can we organize it in such a way that it privileges mutuality, it privileges respect, it privileges a sense of shared fate. So I want to suggest that what we see on the internet is an accelerating contest between three moral economies. Economy of commodities, economy of public goods, and the economy of gifts. And I want to talk you through those relationships. Now, this is a, a bit of a departure from uh, a lot of my own work and a lot of the work that's been done in political economy because political economy uh, of communication really began to take off in the uh, years after World War II. Um, and those years were do dominated both in the US and of, um, particularly in Europe by questions about the, the, the appropriate relationship between uh, markets on the one hand and state enterprise on the other. So you'll find if you've read uh, that literature, it's very much about, first of all, the way that uh, market relations do not deliver all of the resources that people need uh, to understand the world, and why it might be that you need, first of all, regulation of corporations to discipline their worst excesses, but also you need public subsidy of institutions that provide uh, an alternative. 